Hey everyone, um, and welcome to the second day of Zurihack. Um, I hope everyone has a good time so far. Um, so we have a pretty busy day today, and there are a lot of things you can check out. So um, take a look at zurihack.com for the full schedule uh, and all the details. And we're going to kick off today by um, with a talk by Oli. Uh, so Oli is a Haskell developer, um, and very well known for his blog posts about 24 days of hackage, 24 days of GC extensions. Um, he's also doing some cool uh, live streaming on Twitch uh, involving um, building a Vulkan engine, um, sorry, an engine uh, for Quake 3 using Vulkan in Haskell. Um, and today he's going to talk about Relate. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, mm -hmm. uh, a new database library. Um, so Oli, please take it away. Thank you. So yeah, um, hi, everyone. I'm here to talk today about Relate, which is uh, a brand new database access library for Haskell. Uh, and it's so new that we actually only finally got it onto Hackage last night. Um, but the ideas have kind of been brewing for a good couple of years now. So I'm really happy to finally get it out there. Uh, before we get going, I just want to send a massive thank you to Zuri Friends of Haskell as well for putting on another edition of Zuri Hack. So every year, I'm always really looking forward to Zuri Hack. And obviously, things are a little bit different this year. Um, but I'm still really glad that we've got the opportunity to get so many Haskellers together and to talk about some really cool ideas. Uh, also, uh, I think we've got a couple of people in the talk discussion room on Discord. So if you have any questions at any point, drop them in, kind of keep this interactive. Um, and I'll try and answer anything if it pops up, uh, maybe upvote it. And also my co-author, Shane, I think is in that room. and He might drop in and answer some questions as well. So before we get into Relate, just a little bit about me. I think Jasper's kind of uh, explained it quite well. But hi, I'm Ollie, and I've been writing Haskell now for about eight years, uh, six of which I've had the privilege of doing professionally over a couple of different companies. Um, and I've been programming really as long as I can remember, and along that time accumulated really far too many interests. Uh, but as Jasper said, I think I'm maybe somewhat known now for some of my interests in graphics and game development. So as mentioned, uh, as a way to kind of relax, uh, strangely, <laughs> I like to uh, try and re-implement classic video games in Haskell and use Haskell libraries, uh, maybe some new technologies. So on my GitHub profile, I've got re-implementations of Doom. Uh, I tried to re-implement Quake 3 using functional reactive programming. Uh, I'm also a maintainer for the SDL2 library on Hackage, which provides Haskell bindings to the SDLC library, um, which is a cross-platform game development library. Uh, but I'm also interested in all sorts of other things, like domain-specific languages, programming language theory, all those kind of normal Haskell interests. Um, we're not going to be talking about any of that in this talk, but of course, the beauty of Zuri Hack is if you're interested in any of that, just drop me a message uh, and, and we can talk about it. Uh, and these days, I'm a senior developer at Circuit Hub. Um, which is a platform for helping electronics engineers get circuit boards manufactured. So the idea is they design their circuit boards and software, upload their design files to the circuit Hub website, and then we take over the manufacturing process. Uh, and as you might expect, circuit hub is a Haskell project. Um, so all of the backend systems are written in Haskell. Uh, our architecture is a fairly straightforward one, a single page application on the front end written in Elm. Uh, Haskell on the back end, providing a kind of rest, uh, restful API, uh, and a Postgres database storing all of that. And it's this Postgres database um, that's kind of the focus of this talk um, because the interaction with that is what led me to create Relate, um, which is essentially a library for querying a Postgres database. So I want to talk generally about this idea of querying uh, SQL databases from Haskell in general. Um, and whenever we want to do this, we're presented with essentially two main options. So perhaps the most obvious option is we can just literally write SQL. So Hackage has many libraries that just take strings of SQL, send those over to a database, uh, run the database runs that query, we get some rows back, and then we might have to write like a parser or something in Haskell to decode those rows into Haskell data structures. And this is a perfectly valid approach. Uh, it works very well, and it's got some nice benefits. Uh, like we don't really have to learn any new technology at all. All of the knowledge we have about SQL can be used in order to uh, continue working in Haskell. But I do think it has a couple of drawbacks. So Haskell is very known for having uh, this really powerful type system. Um, but we can only take advantage of that type system if we're able to uh, have a rich usage of types throughout our program. And if we're just writing SQL strings, it's very difficult for GHC to kind of see what the meaning of those strings actually is. So it can be difficult to keep track of, say, the rows that are going to be produced by a query. Uh, and if we get this wrong, we're going to end up with things going wrong at runtime. And we'd really like those things to be caught at compile time. 
Um, there are some clever tricks we can do to work around that, um, but we're still limited by what I think is the other problem of writing SQL, which is um, some pretty limited means of abstraction. So as Haskellers, we're used to this idea of being able to build programs from small programs and reason about those independently, and then to compose our program out of these small building blocks. Um, but SQL doesn't really give us any of those uh, means of composition. We have tools like views and stored procedures, um, but these are still quite limited in what they can actually abstract. Uh, and I also think they're quite clunky and heavyweight to use. So writing SQL is simple, obvious, I think difficult to type check, uh, and also, as we start to work with larger and larger projects, um, I think quite difficult to introduce kind of code reuse uh, and things like that. So the other solution we have is to not write SQL, but to instead generate SQL. So in this idea, we're going to work in some kind of domain-specific language or Haskell API um, that provides us with small primitives to write parts of queries, uh, provides us with means of composition, and then we pass this query value of some sort through some kind of interpreter or compiler which will compile to SQL um, and take care of the, the actual SQL um, itself. And as you might expect, this, I think, is a good answer to those problems of writing literal SQL. Um, if we're working in a Haskell domain-specific language, we can take advantage of Haskell's type system, and we can keep track of the types of our query as we build it up. And we also have access to all of Haskell's means of abstraction. So if we ever need to template a query uh, or to factor out some kind of common join condition, we could just introduce a function. We could introduce type classes, and all of the normal tools we have in Haskell are now available to us. Um, there is, of course, no free lunch. This idea of compiling to SQL is significantly more work. Uh, we need to be very careful, for example, that in our domain-specific language, we sufficiently model all of SQL that we need to actually run performant queries. So we don't want to paint ourselves into a corner where an efficient query does exist, but we can't actually write it. And we also have some kind of common problems of impedance mismatch, because SQL and Haskell are not the same language, ORM-like problems of accidentally running queries at the wrong time, things like that. And this idea of compiling to SQL as well is not a Haskell-specific thing. Many other uh, languages have this. So Ruby's got Active Record, Java has Hibernate, uh, Python has SQL Alchemy, things like that. Um, but we could do this in Haskell as well. And so despite some drawbacks to this approach, I still think this is, to me, the, the kind of premier option for actually uh, interacting with a SQL database from Haskell, because mostly because we have the ability to use the type system, and we also have access to really good means of code reuse and abstraction. So this is where Relate comes in. So Relate is a new library that works in this idea of being a domain-specific language, uh, and it's primarily about querying, well, specifically Postgres databases. So Relate is not database agnostic, which may be disappointing to some people who aren't on Postgres, um, but we do take advantage of some unique Postgres features to implement Relate. And in terms of design goals, um, the main design goal of Relate is to be uh, familiar and to use Haskell idioms. So I'm not so interested in building a domain-specific language that kind of looks like SQL. I want a domain-specific language that looks and feels like I'm writing Haskell, but just happens to compile to SQL, um, kind of as a, almost an implementation detail. Um, it was also a design goal of Relate to have really good type inference from the start. Uh, and I think having good type inference also means you need to have some pretty simple types. So I don't want really scary types leaking out into the API, because these are generally quite hard to infer, uh, and they kind of muddy the API documentation. Um, but also, as I said, we want good type inference, which I think makes a very nice experience for users when they try and use a new library. So they can kind of interactively explore the API using GHC type holes. And also, when you have good type inference, it tends to localize error messages quite nicely as well. So hopefully, you'll agree we've managed to achieve that goal if you get a chance to try Relate out. And in terms of responsibilities, uh, Relate's got quite a narrow set of responsibilities. We're just interested in working with what I call like the big four types of queries or CRUD queries, you might know them as, as well, to select, insert, update, and delete. And Relate's also responsible for a bit of serialization. Um, this isn't Relate-specific serialization. There's no custom format or anything. Uh, but I'm trying to emphasize that Relate takes care of writing row parsers and row encoders for you. So you don't have to kind of deal with, how will I decode the results I get back from a database? Uh, and just a little bit of credit as well. Uh, Relate is implemented um, in terms of its kind of internals using Opali by Tom Ellis, which is another uh, library for querying Postgres databases. It's been around for a couple of years. Um, so I want to send a big thank you to Tom. Um, Relate really wouldn't be possible without all of the hard work that Tom has already done. 
Uh, and also, I want to send a big thank you to Shane, who's my uh, colleague and co-author at Circuit Hub. Uh, and I, from talking to Shane about, I've been talking to Shane about this for a good couple of years, uh, and he said he's also had some similar ideas in previous jobs. Um, so it's been really nice to be able to kind of bring all of this stuff together and put it into one place, uh, which is Relate. Uh, just briefly, what Relate isn't. Um, so Relate is just about building queries and kind of running them. It doesn't determine when queries are executed. So it doesn't do anything like try batch up queries and minimize network round trips. Um, that's all kind of out of scope for Relate. You could maybe combine Relate with a library like Haxel if you wanted. Um, that, that probably would be possible. Um, but as I said, out of scope for Relate. And Relate also doesn't have any type of migration system. So you are responsible for creating and maintaining your database schemas. And there are many pieces of software out there that can deal with this. So rather than take kind of one strong opinion on the right way to do it, Relate just doesn't take any opinion at all. Uh, and I just want to talk about why I think um, Relate kind of deserves to exist, because Haskell already has very uh, several very strong offerings for interacting with SQL databases. And there's just a little sample, not even an exhaustive list there on the slide. Um, and whenever we release a new library onto Hackage, I think we need to be mindful of the fact that we do actually end up contributing a little bit of confusion at the same time. So the more libraries we have, the more confusing it is for users to choose which library they actually want to use. So I'm, I think it's important that we understand kind of why our libraries uh, almost deserve to exist, essentially. And I've been grappling with this for quite a while. Um, and over the years, I've, I've kind of realized that the that this design space that SQL libraries can exist in is, is really quite rich. And there are many different dimensions you can exist in. And I want to focus on just one in particular, which is this kind of spectrum of how close you are to the SQL language itself. So at the extreme end of the spectrum, we have libraries that provide essentially no abstraction over SQL at all, which is libraries like HTPC, Postgres Simple. These libraries, you just write SQL. So there's not really an abstraction over the SQL language. But we can move a little further away from this uh, adherence to SQL, and we can start to move into this territory of domain-specific languages, which is where we start to get libraries like Beam, SQLito, Opli, and Selda. But even here, there's a little bit of a kind of space to move around. So I think Beam, for example, is very close to the SQL language. Um, for example, if you look at any of the uh, keywords for a select statement, you'll probably find a corresponding function in Beam's API. Uh, whereas some of these other libraries, I think, are moving more to being a kind of custom abstraction over SQL. Um, but even then, I think all of these libraries are still fairly faithful to what SQL is. And that leaves us with this kind of gap as we move even further away from SQL. And we try and say, well, what happens if I don't try and actually kind of build a domain-specific language that looks like SQL, but I instead give myself a bit of freedom to be a little bit more custom? And I think this is where Relate is sitting. Um, so you'll still see many similarities to SQL, of course. That is ultimately what we're trying to build. Um, but we've made some choices in Relate that um, would maybe not be common uh, if you were thinking purely in terms of trying to write SQL. So that's a bit about uh, kind of what Relate is, uh, why I think Relate exists, what it's going to contribute in terms of its unique features. Uh, and now I just really wanted to get stuck in and actually start having a look at uh, what Relate is. I think the best way to learn about something new is to just kind of actually try it out for real. So we're going to take a little bit of a quick tour of Relate. We'll try and uh, write some Relate code. In terms of the high-level map uh, of what you generally need to do to use Relate uh, for any project, really, is this essentially three-step process. We first need to define Haskell types, which correspond to all of the primitive types in our database schema. So primitive types are the types that we'll use to define columns inside tables. So int, bool, timestamp, all of that kind of stuff. Uh, we'll need a corresponding Haskell type. Once we've got these primitive types, we can then look at defining Haskell types for each of the tables in our database schema, which will, of course, refer back to those primitive type definitions we just created. Uh, and once we've got all of these Haskell definitions, we can then start actually writing some queries and interacting with the database. So this is the example database that we're going to work with in this talk. Really simple database consisting of just two tables, and we're going to keep track of, uh, essentially, songs. So songs are uniquely identified by 64-bit uh, integers. They have a foreign key reference to the artist that composed that song. Uh, artists also identified by integers. And songs and artists both have names, which are just arbitrary pieces of text. So really simple, two tables, one-to-many relationship, um, nothing too advanced there. Um, and this first step, then, will be to define those primitive Haskell types for each of the primitive types in our schema. So the primitive types are uh, int8 and text. Uh, and Relate actually comes with kind of these type mappings for all types that come with a stock Postgres installation right out of the box. 
So we could actually proceed straight to step two at this point if we wanted to. Um, but I just want to pause here for a second because uh, this mapping, I think we could do a slightly better job. And the concern I have here is a song ID and an artist ID are both being assigned to type int64 here. But to me, with my domain knowledge of this database, a song ID and an artist ID are not the same thing. So I never want to be able to say, is this song ID equal to this artist ID, for example? Uh, I don't really want to be able to ask that question because it's nonsensical. And we're faced with this kind of problem a lot in Haskell anyway, and we've got some good tools for dealing with it, which is to introduce new type wrappers. Um, and that's an idea, again, that works with Relate, so we're seeing that idea of familiarity. Um, so instead of using int64, I'm going to define new type definitions for song ID and artist ID, uh, the Haskell code here, down here at the bottom. An artist ID and a song ID are essentially int64s, but by using new type, GHC is able to see that these types are actually distinct and aren't considered to be equal. And to adapt these types to be usable with Relay, I just need to derive a couple of instances. So DB type here says this is a Haskell, uh, sorry, a Postgres type. Uh, and DBEQ is like Haskell's uh, EQ type class, and it will allow us to compare these types for equality in Postgres. So it essentially says there's an equality operator in Postgres. Um, and this is all done by generalized new type deriving as well. So uh, pretty straightforward. We're just inheriting the properties of N64. And at this point, I could go further and maybe I'd want to new type text and say a song name is different from an artist name. But I think actually I'm okay to say that song name and artist names are just bits of text. Um, so I'm going to continue at this point. I'm quite happy with that. So the next step is to define uh, types that correspond to each of the tables in our database schema. And Relate gives us a few different options for doing this. The approach I'm going to look at in this talk is the one that I think is maybe the most idiomatic in Relate uh, and probably the most ergonomic and usable as well, which is to use this pattern of higher kinded data types. So what are higher kinded data types? That sounds maybe a little bit scary. And I've got a one sentence description here that I don't think makes things sound any less scary. Um, but I said higher kinded data types are data types that are parameterized by what I call a context functor. I think it's probably um, a term that I use. Um, but what does that mean? So let's look at a really simple type here. I've got a data type for songs. Uh, and a song is just a record type. And it consists of two fields, song name, song ID, which are text and song ID, respectively. And I refer to a type like this as just plain old data. Nothing special about this data type. We see these kind of definitions all the time in Haskell code. But something interesting happens if we introduce this new f parameter to song. So now the song type is kind of as it was before, but we've parameterized it by f, which is a type constructor. Uh, or I like to also think of this as a kind of type to type function. So we now get to transform the type of all of the fields inside this data type by passing them through f. So we've got the same fields, kind of the same types, but those types have been transformed by f. And this might look a little bit strange, but the idea is it allows us to reuse this single data type and to give it different meanings just by changing the choice of f. So let's have a look at, uh, at some of these different meanings that, have, uh, that we have access to. Um, so one choice of f would be maybe. So maybe as a type constructor, we have the type maybe in, maybe char, maybe bool, and things like that. But we can actually talk about maybe on its own. So maybe takes types and gives you back types. And if we think of maybe as a kind of type level function, I like to think as maybe as taking a type, giving you back that same type, but also extending it with the possibility to have a kind of absence of information. Um, so if we pass in maybe for f here, uh, we then transform the type of all of the fields by wrapping them in a maybe. So we get maybe text and maybe song ID for song name and song ID. Uh, and this allows us then to have songs where we might have partial information. So if I know there's a song with ID 123, I can now talk about that as a song value, even if I don't know what the name of that song is. And this kind of pattern arises when we're doing things like form validation, or maybe we're incrementally building up a data type by having a kind of conversation with a user through some user interface. So that's one meaning we could have. Uh, we also have the identity functor. So at the value level, we have the identity function id or id, which takes a value and gives you back that same value unchanged. We have the same idea at the type level. So the identity functor or identity type function takes types and just gives you back exactly the same type. So now our song name is an identity text, which is really just the same as text. And our song ID is an identity song ID. And that's really just a song ID as well. So this meaning is essentially the same as our plain old data type we saw before. 
Uh, but things can get really quite strange if we start using some pretty exotic choices of f. Um, and one that's a little more interesting here is the constant functor. So in yellow here is the definition of the constant functor. Uh, it takes two types, a and b, uh, and it just throws away that b parameter entirely and just keeps uh, working with an a. So whenever you have a const a, b, no matter what b is, you always have an a. And in this case, I've got const string, which means all of the fields inside the, inside the song value are essentially strings. Now, I call this value metasong because this value is not really talking about songs at all. It's actually kind of self-referential and talking about the song type. So the song name field is the string song name to talk about its own field. And song ID is the string song ID to talk about the song ID field. Uh, and this is really quite strange because in every other case of song ID, we had to provide a number. Uh, and now we can actually provide a string. So we can kind of completely change that type there. So if I lost you a little bit here, don't worry. Uh, it's not too important to like fully understand all of this. I just want to motivate that idea that we can change the meaning of a type just by changing this one type parameter. So relate extends this idea of higher kind of data types uh, to model tables. Uh, and we call these types relatables. So relatable types are higher kind of types where each field uses the column type family. Um, it's a little different than we saw from the higher kind of data type before due to this column type family. Uh, that's just there to make things a little bit more usable in practice. So uh, I don't really want to focus too much on that. Uh, and the other thing we do when we define relatables is we derive an instance of the relatable type class, which we can do by also having access to an instance of the generic type class. And at this point, I think a lot of people might kind of recognize this pattern in terms of database libraries. Um, if you've used the Beam library, uh, this is pretty much exactly what Beam does as well. So I do want to send a massive thank you and kudos out to Beam, because uh, uh, it was in Beam when I first discovered this idea, and I think it's really quite nice. So we've got a, a very similar idea over in Relate. But a relatable just defines the, sh uh, the shape of a table. It doesn't have the necessary metadata to actually be able to select from that table. So we haven't named the table in our Postgres schema, and we haven't named any of the columns in that table either, which is, of course, vital information. And we can provide this information by constructing a value of the table schema type. So a table schema contains the table name and the schema that that table belongs to, but it also contains the name of the columns. And to provide the names of the columns, we use a specific meaning of our relatable type, and we set it to be existing in the, the name context. So the name context uh, essentially names all of the columns. This is a bit like that meta song type we, uh, value we saw earlier. Um, so the song ID field will map to the ID column. The song name field maps to the song name column, song artist to artist. Uh, but also it's worth noticing here that this allows us then to have Haskell names that don't necessarily correspond to names in our database schema, which I think is quite important because Haskell names, we have this kind of strange naming convention in Haskell, uh, and I don't want to enforce that on our database. So if you're using a database with other libraries, for example, they don't all have to use Haskell naming conventions as well. Uh, if you do want to do that, though, you can actually derive these uh, song uh, column name values generically as well. So uh, we could do this generically, but we're going to do this kind of explicitly for now. Uh, and one, now that we've got uh, the definitions of our primitive types, we've got that relatable for uh, the song table, and we'd have a corresponding relatable for the artist table, we can now go forth and start writing some queries. So queries in relate, uh, select queries in particular, are values of uh, the query A type. So A is a type parameter here, which is the type of the row that's being selected by a query. Uh, and relate is essentially giving you a big suite of functions to build and compose these query values. That's the bulk of the relate library. And at this point, I think we can just go over to uh, my editor and let's start actually having a play with Relate. So that's probably enough listening to me go through some slides. Let's actually look at some code and start uh, yeah, writing some, some queries. I suppose also if we've got any questions at this point, that might be a good time. Um, so there is one question. <coughs> sorry, and um, so Liang is wondering if there's a story or a meaning behind the name Relate. Uh, not really. Um, uh, so you'll see on GitHub, I've got a little one-line sentence for relate, which just says, hey, hey, can you relate? Um, which is a kind of homage to, uh, like a, I guess, like a house song or something from the 90s. And it just got stuck in my head, I think, one day. Or maybe I was listening to it while I was playing with these ideas. And I was like, huh, relate, relations. 
Let's go with that. Uh, and also the eight there as well, I've now remembered. Uh, Relate was meant to be kind of showcasing some really cool features that only existed in GHC8. So I thought, oh, that's kind of a good little pun. Uh, amusingly, the, the kind of first final version of Relate actually worked on GHC7, um, but Rel, Rel7 didn't really have the same ring to it. <laughs> so it's, yeah, there's no real meaning. That's kind of the slight story behind it, but it sounds cute, so I kind of stuck with it. Yeah, that's um, quite cool. <laughs> Um, someone else asked how Relate compared to all the alternatives on Hackage, but I think you already answered that when you sort of did the um, the previous slide. So maybe we can come back to that at the end. Yeah, I think, so I, I kind of purposely want to avoid that a little bit and maybe let people make that comparison themselves. So maybe if I show some of Relate's uh, kind of API, um, that question will be answered as well. Um, but we could also have a kind of offline conversation on that as well. I don't really want to get too bogged down in comparisons because I probably won't do the other libraries justice. Um, okay, so let's have a look at writing some queries. So the first one that I'm going to look at writing is just a simple kind of select star from artists. So uh, your kind of bread and butter queries. And we write a select star in Relate by using the each function. Um, so this may look a little scary here. I'm going to gloss over this recontextualize uh, context just for the moment. But essentially, each is a function which takes a table schema and gives us back a query that returns the rows within that table schema. Um, uh, the file that I'm working in here uh, already has kind of step one and two completed for both. Uh, if I just scroll up, we've got the primitive types, and we've got the relatables and the table schemas for these relatables for the two tables in our database. So here, uh, the type of artist schema is a table schema for artist name. So I can pass that into each. And I now get back a query that returns me artist rows. And we can already see Relate is able to change the meaning of these uh, types. So while we started in the name context, when we pass this table schema through each, we then get back a query where our relatable is now in the extra context. And the extra context is the context for uh, kind of columns or expressions inside a query. So we don't have access to the actual results of a query at this point, but we can still talk about the columns that we're selecting. We could add columns together, things like that. Um, so let's uh, let's copy this down. So if I say all artists is each artist schema. Uh, let's reload that. So uh, we can run this query as well. Um, so Relate provides this select uh, function which just takes a database connection and the query that you want to run, and it gives you back an IO action containing a list of all of the rows that would be selected from that query. Uh, and again, the type may be a little scary here. Maybe um, if you're kind of familiar with some of the other libraries, this looks familiar. Um, I've got a slight specialization of this that just gets rid of the connection that we'll be using throughout this talk. So if I select the all artists query, I then get back an IO action where my artists are now in the result context. So we've changed context yet again, and we've now moved from expert to result. And the result context is kind of decoded results from a database. Uh, so if we actually run that, you can then see my database has three different artists, and I get a kind of normal show instance from, uh, from Haskell that we'd expect. Um, and maybe, let's see if I can do this as well, uh, fmap artist name over this. Yeah, and you can see that artist name turned into just a normal text column as well. So all of that column type family, that's essentially what that's doing. It's kind of um, de-sugaring once you're in this result context. Uh, and if you're interested, uh, we can also say show query, we can say show query all artists. And this is what Relate has actually generated and sent over to the Postgres database. So already we're seeing that the generated SQL is already a fair bit different from what we might intuitively expect. Um, and that's kind of OK. Uh, well, I'd say it's, it's definitely OK. It's, it's a liberty that we want to allow Relate to have. It can kind of generate whatever queries it wants, as long as these queries have good performance characteristics. Um, so you can see in here, it's essentially the select star part. And up here, we've got uh, some Relate has added some casts in, which just gives us a little bit of an extra safety net to make sure the rows we get back do uh, map well to the Haskell types that we've provided. Um, let's have a look at just a slightly more advanced query, so very slightly more advanced. We're just going to add a limit clause on. So I want a query that selects me just one row. Um, we can do that by using the limit function. So now if I say one artist, I'm going to say limit one, and I have to provide the query that I want to limit, and I can just reuse that existing all artist query that I had before. So uh, let's select one artist, and unsurprisingly, I get back a, uh, a row with just one artist in. So not too surprising there. 
Uh, let's look at a, a kind of more interesting query now. Uh, now I'm going to look at paginating the artist table. So when we do pagination in SQL, that generally corresponds to three operations. First of all, we need to order the rows that we're going to paginate. Uh, we then limit the amount of rows that will actually be returned on a single page. And we'll also need to offset to go to the page that's being requested by the user. So I'm going to say paginate artists. Uh, it takes a page number. Um, we'll kind of work backwards. Um, so the first thing I'm going to do is limit the number of rows to be the number of rows on a page. Let's say a page size is just two. Uh, I'm going to offset to the requested page, which we can do with the offset function. So I'm going to say page number minus one, because offsets start from zero, and page size. Uh, and then we need to order the rows as well. And we can do ordering and relate by using order by, which just takes a query, returning rows of type A, uh, some type of ordering for those rows, and then gives us back a query with the rows in that order. So let's say order by, and I'll order by artist name in ascending order, and we'll paginate the all artists table. Uh, so let's see, did that do what we expect? So if I say paginate artists on page one, I get back two rows. If I go into uh, the third page, I get back just one row, and I go into the third page, uh, I get no rows at all. So that's kind of doing the right thing. Um, but Relate actually provides us with some nice tools which will allow us to actually, uh, we don't even need to talk about this ordering explicitly. Um, so something we get in Relate is uh, the ability to just order arbitrary relatables. So we've got both ask table and desk table, which sort a table into ascending or descending order uh, by lexicographically ordering all of the columns inside that table. Um, so what that means is I can instead say just, well, I'm just going to order by all artists into ascending order. Uh, and if I run this again, we'll get back uh, some slightly different rows, I think, this time, because we've now, or maybe this is the same, I think I did artist name before, um, but we've got back uh, our artist sorted first by artist ID and then by artist name. So yeah, sorry, this is slightly different before, because previously I sorted just by the artist name. But now I'm going to sort first by artist ID and then by the artist name. Uh, and if you wanted to see that, uh, oh, I'll take that select out, sorry. Uh, and this kind of fairly monster query is what Relate has generated now. So we said ask table and Relate generated an ordering that ordered by ID into ascending order and then name. Um, and the reason it chose ID first and then name is because that's exactly the order of the fields inside our data type. So this ask table is quite similar uh, to the ORD API and the ORD type class that Haskell gives us. So if you derive ORD for a, a type, um, Haskell will order that type by all of its fields in a kind of lexicographic ordering. But now that we've done ask table, something interesting happens, which is I could actually have a pagination function that doesn't even care about what table I'm trying to paginate. Uh, I could do that just by passing in a one of these table schemas. So now my paginate, uh, maybe rename that as well, because it's not talking about paginating artists. Uh, like that. So now paginate just takes anything that can be ordered, um, and a table schema containing some column names um, we've got this recontextualized, which kind of indicates that Relate will need to go from the name context to the extra context. Uh, and I could now do something like, uh, well, I could select paginate artist schema, which is what we did before, and look at page one. But I could also reuse that pagination function to look at paginating songs as well. So I've kind of quite easily got this very reusable pagination function that paginates uh, based on uh, the ordering, the kind of implicit ordering of the table. Um, so I think that's kind of fun. Uh, let's just have a look. At, we'll go back to some simple queries now, just basic projections. So if I wanted artist names, um, I could use the FMAP instance of query. So if I say artist name, FMAP over all artists, fairly unsurprisingly, I get back a list containing just artist names. Uh, the type of that is just an IO action that returns text, so no wrap types or anything, which is also quite nice. Uh, and this is, again, a fairly familiar API to Haskell programmers. I think this idea of using FMAP for projection is quite natural. Um, we do similar things when we're working with lists, for example. Uh, but we also have another API available for doing projection, which is to use the Monad instance. So I could instead uh, bind artists to be each row in the all artists query, and then I could return a transformation of that artist row uh, by just using return and passing that artist through the artist name function. Um, again, surprisingly, uh, that gives me back the same results. 
I just want to pause a second and we'll talk about what this query monad actually means. So it's the monad instance that gives us the ability to kind of compose queries together, or at least it's one of the means of composition offered to us by Relate. Uh, but what does it mean for query to be an instance of monad? The monad instance of query corresponds to the relational algebra Cartesian product operation. And if you're not familiar with that, um, which could take a second to, to walk through what that means, um, but it pairs two queries together by pairing each row from the first query with each row in the second query. So here in the top left, I've got my song table, and down in the bottom right, I've got my artist table. And if I take the Cartesian product of these two tables, uh, we can see I end up pairing E1, M1 with both Bobby Prince and Sonic Mayhem, producing the first two rows. And then I pair Quad Machine uh, with the two artists again to produce the next two rows. Um, so it's basically a kind of fully information preserving join. Uh, and, the, and we could write um, that in relate if we jump back over. Uh, we could say artist x songs. Um, so artist is each row from the artist schema, and song is each row from the song schema. And then I can just return a tuple to combine uh, those two rows together. So there's no special kind of row combining operators in relate. You just use tuples as you normally would. Uh, so if we have a look at that, uh, I'm going to call it artist x songs. Uh, I get back. Quite a lot of results, actually, because my database is a little bigger than the example slide. Maybe if we just use artist name and song name, we can see that it's kind of paired up every artist with every song in the database. Um, and we just use do notation to perform that Cartesian product. And the reason that like, this is a nice operation is because this is actually quite fundamental in relational algebra. And we can derive a lot more operations from the Cartesian product. Um, and one operation we can derive is the inner join operation, which is usually a much more interesting type of operation to perform than the, the kind of straight Cartesian product. Um, so I might be interested in knowing for any song in my database, uh, who's the artist that composed that song. And if I just take the Cartesian product, I end up with a result that's too big. So uh, we can see E1M1 is composed by Bobby Prince, and Quad Machine was composed by Sonic Mayhem. So the correct rows are returned in green, but because the Cartesian product also gave me these rows that have the, the kind of the, the wrong answer. And what I need to do is to filter this uh, based on the, uh, the artist ID in the song with the artist ID from the artist table. Uh, so I need to filter this Cartesian product based on uh, that predicate. So we have a question from the channel that may be useful for, for understanding the talk. I'm saving up some of the other questions for the sure. end. Um, so could you show the SQL query underlying the example where, yeah. with the two uh, eaches? Because someone was wondering if this would generate, uh, basically do two queries or sort of combine them into, into one query. Yeah, yeah. No, that's a good question. Yeah. So um, let's have a look at the query for artist x songs. Uh, so this is what Relate generates. Um, so the, the, the lateral keyword here is also uh, kind of interesting, which is what gives us true monadic, um, true monadic abilities inside queries. So I, not entire, I think this is a standard SQL keyword, um, but Postgres has good support for lateral queries. Um, <clears throat> but here we can see the first each is essentially here, and then the second each is down here. So we've kind of just selected from both of those tables and, and taken their Cartesian product. Um, so hopefully that provides a bit of clarity as to what's going on yeah. there. But yes, it is running exactly one query. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so this was what happens if we apply that filter to the Cartesian product. If we filter based on these two columns, 200 and 200 being equal, we get back exactly the rows we're interested in. So uh, let's have a look at artists with songs, which will be that inner join we're talking about. The so artist is each artist schema and song is each song schema. So that's the Cartesian product we saw before. Uh, we can apply the filtering operation by using the where function. Um, there are a couple of other ways we could do this, but I'll use where for now. <coughs> so I'm going to say artist ID artist is the same as the song artist for song. And if this where clause, uh, this where predicate essentially is true, we'll kind of reach this return line, in which case I can return, uh, let's return artist name and song name. Um, but if that predicate fails, uh, we'll essentially end up going back and choosing a different combination of artist and song to try and find another case where the, the where clause holds. Uh, so let's try artist with songs one. 
So now I get back, you can see it's a subset of that Cartesian product where I get back just the rows that I'm interested in. So that's how you could write a inner join in Relate. Um, but I, what I like to do, actually, uh, actually, not to copy all of that, is I like to factor out just this part of uh, this larger query, which is essentially the join condition for how to get to songs from artists. So if I say songs for artists, I can then factor that out into a function that, given an artist, will return me every song for that artist. Um, so it's basically the same as what we did before. Um, I select every song that I know about, and I filter out just the songs where the song artist matches the artist ID for the artist that I've been given. Uh, and once I've got that, I can, of course, recover that original query. So songs, artists with songs two. Now, rather than selecting directly from the song table, I can pass my selected artist through songs for artists. Uh, actually, I'm going to make that singular a bit clearer. Uh, and this will do you know, the same kind of thing that we've been uh, looking at before. Um, but once we've got this join function factored out, we can actually do some kind of interesting things with that. So let's just pause for a second and look at this artist with songs uh, result. Uh, we can see we've got Bobby Prince and we've got Sonic Mayhem here. If I go back to the artist names query that I wrote earlier, uh, you can see we also have Mick Gordon in the results, but he's not showing up in artists with songs too. And the reason for this is in my current instance of this database, Mick Gordon doesn't have any songs associated with him. And if I take the inner join of artists and songs, I'm going to lose any artists that don't have songs associated, because the inner join will fail, um, so I can't produce any rows there. So what we need to do in, in normal SQL is to use the left join operator instead to make our join essentially partial. Uh, and Relate doesn't actually have a special left join operator. Uh, instead, we have something much more general which is this fairly magical function called optional. So let's jump back over and, and have a look at what optional is. Um, so this, again, is the type of optional. It takes a query returning rows of type A, uh, and it gives us back a query returning rows of type A, but then they're wrapped up in the special maybe table uh, type. And the idea of optional is if you give optional a query that does produce some rows, so a non-empty query, optional returns you those same rows, but they all get wrapped up in this uh, just table constructor. Uh, and if you give optional an empty query, optional returns you a query that does return a row. So it turns an empty query into a non-empty query, and you get back one row, which is a nothing table. Um, so of course, maybe table, just table, nothing table, all meant to be evocative of the idea of the maybe type in Haskell. Uh, and optional allows us to observe uh, essentially empty queries, which will allow us to recover the functionality of a left join. So let's have a look at what that means. I'm just going to literally copy artists with songs too. Well, artists with songs free, but now rather than directly passing my artist through songs for artists, I'm going to wrap this up in a call to optional. I jump back over. I'm going to get a type error because the returned song from this uh, this line here is now not a song extra, but it's a maybe table song extra. Uh, and if I'm interested in only getting the song name of that, uh, I can just use maybe tables func for instance, and I can project out just the name of the song. Uh, so let's see what happens if we run this name. Uh, artists with song free. And you can see now I've got more results in this list. So Bobby Prince, Sonic Mayhem, as before, but also Mick Gordon now associated with a nothing. Uh, and we can see also Relate is kind of taking care of uh, transporting those types between queries and results. So the original query type was a query that produced extra text and maybe table extra text. So the artist name and maybe a song name. Um, but if we select that, uh, all of that kind of relate specific stuff uh, kind of just falls away and we're left with an IO action that returns a list of pairs of text and maybe text. So we're back in that familiar kind of Haskell, um, the familiar Haskell types. Um, and let's just pause for a second and look at what maybe table is, because you, you're probably quite curious what's actually going on there. So relate provides this opaque table wrapper type maybe table, which is meant to be like the type maybe. We can't use the actual maybe type itself, because when we're in a query, um, we'd have to essentially produce maybe values for the rest of a, a monadic do block. And we can't do that, because we don't know what we're actually going to get back. So we work in this abstraction called maybe table, which is kind of like a suspended view of what maybe is. Uh, and whenever we have a maybe table t, for any table t, so that could be a relatable, it could be a, a tuple of relatables, things like that. Uh, and maybe table T is the same as that, 
but we have the extra conditions that all of the columns of that table could be null. And relate's going to add on kind of transparently, and you won't really get to see this because it's entirely internal, but it adds on an extra special tag column onto that table to keep track of whether or not it knows the row is present. Um, so let's have a look at what this means. We have this E1, M1 uh, value here, which is a song expra. So songs have three columns. So you can see the three columns in the data type here. And we could pass this through the just table smart constructor, and then we'll get back a maybe table song expra. And this is essentially the same as what we've seen before, but relate adds on an extra column here uh, and kind of keeps track of a, a tag called just. So it's aware that this row is present. Um, but we also have nothing table. Um, which is also a maybe table song extra. We don't have to provide any information because this is the absence of information, essentially. It's the kind of not existing song row. And in this case, we have as many columns as we would in song extra. We set all of them to null, and then we also set this tag column to nothing. And relate is taking care of all of this for you, so you're not really seeing this. Uh, relate will also kind of fold that tag into queries. So if it sees something as a nothing, it knows kind of to collapse all of the columns to, to null and things like that. Um, but that's what gives us the machinery of being able to kind of keep track as to whether or not a query produced any rows. So we can see if a query does produce rows, we'll wrap them up in just table. Uh, and if the left join fails, we can kind of observe this by producing this uh, special nothing table row. Um, so maybe let's just have a look. I'm not sure if this is even going to fit on the screen, but we'll try. Uh, if I have a look at actually showing that query, uh, artist with songs free. Uh, so this is what's actually being kind of sent over to the database. Um, the optional does compile bound to a left join. So left join is obviously special in SQL, and we do need to produce left join in our SQL. But the idea is we don't actually need to express that in relate. Uh, let's see if we can find the tag column. Uh, I think this is the tag column uh, that's being added in onto that left join. And then also relate is taking care of kind of folding that tag column over other columns. So, I'm showing this just so you can kind of see what's going on behind the scenes. The idea is you don't actually have to be aware of this at all. Um, the idea is this should be, uh, again, it's a familiar API. Um, and maybe experienced Haskellers will be familiar with the optional um, function from control.applicative. The idea of optional from relate is to be, is meant to be very similar to that operator. So optional normally works for alternative functors, takes FAs and gives you back F maybe A. Optional and relate works for queries and takes query A's and gives you back query, maybe table A. So it's meant to be familiar. Um, and maybe table as well has this familiar API. Um, as maybe table is meant to look like maybe, we give you many operators that let you work with these things as if they were maybe values. So maybe table lets you do case analysis inside a query. Uh, we've got nothing table and just table, which are the smart constructors. Uh, if you need to construct these things yourself, uh, there's a note here that you could also use pure. So maybe table is an instance of functor, applicative, monads, all those things. Um, we've got is nothing table and there's just table predicates. There's all sorts of things here. I won't go through all of them, um, but they're all in the, the API documentation. Um, and also one other kind of cute little thing we can do is we can actually, uh, we have an, an inverse operation to optional. So uh, that's the type of optional. We've also got cat maybe table, which uh, essentially is like cat maybe uh, on lists, which will remove any nothing tables and give you back um, just the just tables produced by a query, which essentially lets you turn a left join back into an inner join. So uh, if I take this optional I had before and now pass those results through cat maybe table. Uh, let's see, that's artist with songs four. I get back to where I was before. Um, which is that inner join operation. So uh, let's go back to Artist with Songs Free. I'm just stopping here for a second, because if I look at the results here, while I've got all the information that I'm interested in, I find it a bit of a shame that Sonic Mayhem is kind of repeated in this list. Uh, and what's quite typical when we get results back from a database is we get a very flat structure. So we get this kind of tabular form. But usually, we want a more uh, descriptive structure of the results we get back, some kind of tree shape, for example. Um, then we'll turn that into a JSON object, for example, if we're building an API server. Um, and I could do some post-processing on this list. So I could go over this list. I could collect elements of the list where the first element of this tuple is common. Um, but Relate actually um, can take care of that and do that at query time for you. 
And we do that by using the many function. So many is, is kind of similar to optional. It takes a query and it gives us back a new query. But rather than wrapping the results in a maybe table, we now get the results wrapped in a list table. So let's have a look and see what that means. So now I say artist with songs five. Let's get back to this form. And rather than using optional, I'm going to use many. Uh, we had a, a bunch of instance there. Unfortunately, we can't do this because we haven't yet uh, worked out a way to make list tables be an instance of functor. Uh, so for now, I'm just going to move that fmap call into uh, the query that I'm running. Uh, so now, if I select artist with songs five, you can see I got back a kind of tree result. So rather than just being a flat list, I've now got a list where every element is an artist name paired up with a list of all of the songs that that artist has composed. Uh, and indeed, if we have a look at the type, you can see that in the, the type of the uh, returned rows, and that's the type of the query that's being executed here. Um, so what's happening is Relate is actually running an aggregation operation inside our SQL query uh, and accumulating all of the returned songs into a list. Uh, and this idea, uh, you can even do this on uh, entire tables. You don't have to project out just uh, individual fields. So we could also just remove that fmap entirely. And now, uh, artist with songs five is a query that returns artist names and lists of the songs. If we select that, we'll get back artist names with lists of songs. And if I run that, you can kind of see exactly that returned in, in the query results. Um, we've also got a, a kind of familiar to the control.applicative uh, module, which has optional and many, um, which we're trying to replicate. We also have a sum function, which actually has the correct type as well. Um, so we could also say, instead of saying many, I could say sum here. Uh, whoops, oops, increment that. And now us with song six is rather than a list table, it's a non-empty table. And if I select that back, I'll get back a non-empty list of songs, which kind of corresponds to, like, we're back to that inner join idea. So Mick Gordon has now vanished because there's no non-empty list of songs to associate Mick Gordon with. Uh, where are we next? Um, so there are more kind of, of these query to query transformations. So rather than saying so, some, some people sorry. ask if you do could do a quick show query on hmm, some of I the latest queries. So five or six, I guess. Yeah, sure. Let's have a look at five. Uh, this definitely will probably not fit on the screen, but maybe we'll get lucky. Yeah. So uh, what's happening is the many compiles down to uh, an aggregation operation. Um, we have to, whenever we do aggregations, we have to say how we're going to aggregate each of the columns. So Relate is going to do an array aggregation for each of the columns. Um, but it keeps track of exactly which columns are being aggregated through that list table type. Uh, and it knows when we get rows back from the database to expect, essentially, a product containing lots of array aggregations. Um, so yeah, there's a whole bunch of stuff going on here. Maybe if you guys want to grab uh, uh, grab Relate and do the show query yourself, uh, you might be able to see what's going on. But the idea, yeah, is to use uh, the array ag operator, essentially. Thanks. Um, let's see what else have we got. So, oh, yeah. Uh, we might be interested in not seeing all of the songs that an artist has, but maybe just knowing how many songs does an artist have. So artist with song seven now. Uh, let's just select that. Um, just gives us back an integer. Uh, which associates each, each artist's name with how many songs they have. So this, again, is another uh, aggregation operation happening uh, kind of under the hood. Um, so I think it's, it's essentially corresponding to account star. But Relate is also being careful to make sure um, that it can return zero. So it's also kind of clever enough to know that even though songs for artists didn't produce any rows at all for Mick Gordon, we still get back to see uh, a zero there. Uh, I might be interested in not even knowing the count of songs. I might just want to know, uh, does this artist have a song? So here I could say um, exists. So uh, show you the type of that, sorry. So exists takes a query, returning rows to type A, and just gives us back a ball as to whether or not that query did produce any results. Uh, let's run that one. Uh, and again, you can see McGordon is still here, so we can see false. Uh, maybe I want to look at uh, not artists and songs, but just artists that have songs. So I want to filter out artists based on the idea, uh, based on the knowledge that they have a song. 
Uh, we can use a slightly different function here called with. So with takes uh, a row and, a, and if this function returns any rows, you get back the row that you started with. So what that means is I could say uh, something like with songs for artists. So songs for artists has this A to query B type. Uh, songs, what are they called? Songs for artists, sorry. Uh, let's select that. And now I've kind of applied a where exists function, um, where exists transformation on that query. So I just get back artists where a song row is present, but we don't get to see what that row is. Uh, and finally, I just wanted to show you something else that's really cool. Um, so uh, let's say I want not to pair up artists with songs, but I just want to know what are all of the artists in my database and what are all of the songs in my database. Um, so that's kind of like a union operation. So uh, all artists with all songs. Uh, I'm going to union each row from the artist schema with each row from the song schema. That's kind of intuitively what I want to do. Um, but if I try and write that query, I get a type error because uh, the union function and the union operator in SQL needs me to have two lists of the same type. So it seems like I'm a little stuck here. Um, but we kind of have this problem in Haskell as well. For example, if I have a list containing Booleans, and a list containing chars, I can't add those two lists together. Um, but what I could do is I could, uh, oh, uh, well, it's not working because I apparently don't have the correct operator in scope. Uh, let's try, oh dear, let's try importing prelude then. There we go. Uh, I can inject both of the, the true and the char into a common type, either bool and char, and then I can combine those lists together. Uh, and we can actually do the same type of thing in relate. So let's bring this over here. And now, rather than unioning artist schema with song schema, I'm going to wrap up each artist schema in a left table and each song schema in a right table. And if I run this, I could then select all artists with all songs. And I get back a list where any left value is an artist and any right value is a song. Um, the type of that is an IO action that literally returns an either artist or song, um, but the query type um, will use this either table type thing. So this idea of maybe table is also present for a bunch of other types in Relate. So uh, we've got maybe table, either table, these table. Um, these are all kind of table wrappers that are present. Um, and just going back to running that, you can see I get this alternating left, right, left, right. Maybe I'm not entirely happy with that. Um, so an either table is an instance of or table, so I could order uh, the results I get back just by using uh, order by ask table. So now uh, I first ordered my results by being a left. And then for all of the lefts, I've ordered them by their ID and then their artist name into ascending order. Uh, OK, I think that's everything I wanted to talk about um, in terms of like a quick whirlwind tour of the API. Uh, Relate can do far more than I can actually cover in one talk. Um, but the good news is we've got some pretty extensive API documentation on Hackage. Um, so if you're interested in seeing what particular functions do, you can consult the documentation there. And if you want something that's maybe a bit more article level, um, head over to relate.readthedocs, uh, where we've got a tutorial. Uh, we've got some kind of more in-depth discussion of some of the concepts inside Relate. So what is a DB type? Um, what are the kind of, there, there are some other uh, type classes like DB type, like DBEQ, DB ORD, kind of explains those things. Uh, and some other things that we just haven't touched on on this talk. So there's some other cool ideas, I think, that are up there. Uh, Relate's an ongoing project, um, but I'm pretty happy to call it stable. Um, we've already done the, the 20 rewrites necessary to get to this point. And I think at this point, uh, we're, we're pretty happy with all of the ideas there. Uh, small little things are changing as we do discover new things. But for the most part, I'm, I'm pretty happy to call it stable and also quite stable in terms of performance and bugs. So we've been running this at Circuit Hub for a good few years now. Uh, and while bugs have cropped up, of course, um, we're not kind of seeing any regular bugs in production at the moment. So I'm sure there are bugs, um, but I would love it if you can help me find them. So please do try to say and let me know what you think. Um, I've got the GitHub link down at the bottom. There's an issue tracker. And I'll happily take bugs, feature requests, how do I do something, all that kind of stuff will be welcome. Uh, we're in the Relate channel on Discord as well if you want to drop in there. And I'm happy to, to run through some stuff. Maybe you've got a database that you want to try and query. And I'm happy to kind of, kind of walk you through how to use Relate for that. Um, but other than that, thanks, everybody, for listening. Hopefully that was uh, interesting and, and you kind of 
can see the appeal of Relate. Um, and I'd love to take any questions you have. Thanks, Ali. I uh, very much enjoyed the talk. It was very nice. Um, so yeah, there are some, some questions uh, from the channel. So I'll, I'll try to kind of get them in order. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think one interesting question is you explained that Relate is actually, the syntax you use is actually quite far from SQL. Mm -hmm. um, does that mean it would be possible to sort of like separate it from the from the backend as well? Um, or is it very much married to uh, Postgres right now? I think I think it's possible. Um, we've tried to not be database agnostic for the moment just because well, CircuitHub is a Postgres project and it was kind of built originally for CircuitHub's purposes. Um, I've often seen database agnostic projects struggle to I don't want to be too accusational here, but can, you can kind of struggle to do a very good job for all of the projects. So I, right now I'm focused just on Postgres because I want to do a, like an excellent job at Postgres. But maybe maybe it would be possible. Maybe we could introduce some type classes or something. We would end up clustering the API a little bit. Uh, I played around with Backpack for this kind of stuff as well. So maybe there's an approach where we could use Backpack to provide the kind of implementation details. Um, but I think at the moment I'm gonna I'm gonna stick with Postgres, and also we're we're kind of leaning on some Postgres specific features. I think so. Maybe the ideas of array aggregations and things like that. I'm not even sure if that necessarily exists in the same setting in other database libraries, but it may be possible. Right. Thanks. Uh, another topic that came up is that the sort of generated SQL seems to have like a lot of nested queries and so on. Mm -hmm. um, do you have sort of have any um, feeling with how efficient this is? or does this has become an issue sometimes? Yeah, so this is also why I'm kind of very interested in targeting Postgres because Postgres has uh, an absolutely fantastic optimizer that it's running on all of these queries. Um, so for all of the queries that we tend to run at CircuitHub, we've been benchmarking them, we've been generating query plans, uh, and Postgres does a, a pretty fantastic job of actually seeing what you're trying to do, even though we give it this absolute monstrosity of a query that nobody would really reasonably write. Um, so for the most part, um, it does a good job of actually generating the correct query plan. The downside is, of course, reading these queries is a little bit more difficult. Um, so if you're trying to debug a query uh, or to understand maybe one part of that query is slow and you can see that in the query plan, you're trying to go back to the Haskell code that can be a little bit difficult. Um, but there is a kind of common pattern in the queries that are generated that may make it possible for people to, uh, if they spend a bit of time, you can kind of get back to the original intent in that Haskell code. Um, I've played around as well with writing a little optimizer to try and get rid of some of that. Um, but I'm kind of essentially at this point not entirely convinced that it really adds too much. Um, so of course, if we do have more code, we add more potential for bugs. So at the moment, we're kind of just living with this. Uh, and I think Shane might be able to give exact numbers, but we've got some queries that literally generate about like 250 kilobytes of SQL, which seems crazy. But again, Postgres has no real problem with this. It's got a fast parser and a good planner. So um, it's not really been a problem for us so far. Cool. And then maybe a follow-up question. Um, I guess it hasn't been a problem yet, but would it be possible to write a custom SQL query or like maybe part of your query express it sort of like, oh, I really just want to use this literal sort of like SQL mm -hmm. query right here. Is that possible using mm -hmm. this library? Yeah, so um, certainly for uh, uh, SQL expressions, we have the unsafe literal function, which just takes a string and gives you back an expression of any type. So it's kind of like an unsafe coerce type thing. Um, so you could write some literal SQL there. Uh, you can't currently write literal SQL for an entire select fragment. Um, but what I'd suggest there is that would be a good uh, place to use a view. So you could create a SQL view that does all of your complex uh, kind of joins or whatever that can't be expressed and relate efficiently. Um, and then you could use that view inside your query as if it were a table. So that's probably what I'd suggest to people there. Um, I would like us to have more uh, kind of escape patches. Um, so I think that's something that is lacking in the API at the moment. Um, but yeah, we have unsafe literal, so you can create any SQL expression. Um, we have things like unsafe cast and stuff like that. So there are some escape patches, but your your best option will probably be to create views if you need to. Um, so thank you. And then we have some more uh, questions around um, migrations and schemas and so on. Mm -hmm. um, so one question is sort of just like how you personally or at CircuitHub use migrations and if you have like sort of tools for that that work well with Relate. Mm -hmm. 
so, so as I said, um, the migration story, at least for us at Circuit Hub, is, is, is completely separate from Relate. Uh, we use the DB migrations library on Hackage, um, which basically gives you YAML files that contain um, literal SQL. Uh, and it uh, provides an abstraction, which is a basic dependency graph on those migrations. So as we do migrations, uh, all of my colleagues will generally write one of these migration files, check it into the repository, and then whenever we do a deployment, we run the migrations um, and just apply kind of each of them according to the topological ordering that DB migrations can see in that dependency graph. Uh, I think there's also, I think it's called like Postgres simple migrations or something on Hackage, which is a similar idea, which is quite nice. Uh, and I know there's all sorts of other kind of more elaborate ways to, to do this. Um, I, I probably should say like Relate does have a pretty good amount of information uh, about your table. So there may be some possibility to, to write a kind of third party migrations library using Relate. It's just not something that we've actually looked at at the moment. Um, right, thank you. And so another question is, um, was about indices and how do you uh, provide those? And I assume you use like a similar story as a, as a migrations there. Yeah, so if we if we see a need for an index, for, like we benchmark a query and we see it's slow, um, that's just a, a normal migration. So we'll write one of these YAML files, we'll add a create index um, and yeah, it, it, that's essentially a very separate concern from Relate because Relate was generating the correct query. The plan was wrong, um, and we can influence the plan by just providing an index. We don't need to change the query. Yeah. Um, so we have some other questions as well. So I think one particular interesting question is if some types are supported by Relate and like what that would look like. Mm -hmm. So there is some support for some types. Um, you can't, so we saw the uh, derive relatable kind of pattern for relatable types. Uh, you can't have those types be some types. Um, but what you can do is you can wrap these types. Um, there's a type called ADT, I think, in the Relate API, um, which essentially does that idea of tagging that we saw for maybe table. So if you have a some type, which is essentially a list of alternative relatables, um, you, if you wrap that up in an ADT, Relate will collapse all of those down into a single row, combining all of their fields and then adding a tagging column for you. It'll keep track of maintaining that tag. And when you select that ADT wrapper, as we saw with maybe table and things, will just completely vanish. Um, so it's maybe not quite first class, but it's pretty close. Um, and, but it's also definitely doable. So yes, there is, there is some support for some types. All right, thank you. Um, another question is we've mainly looked at select queries mm -hmm. during a during a talk now. Um, so someone was wondering what kind of insert, delete, update operations, what they look like. Mm -hmm. um, I'm thinking, I, I won't share uh, the screen to show you this, but uh, essentially, uh, I think our support for insert, update, and delete is uh, a little primitive at the moment. So we've got insert functions that essentially take lists of rows. Um, you can specify an on conflict clause if you want. Um, you can specify a returning clause. But this, to me, feels like a very SQLy API. And this is something that we are kind of actively looking to explore at the moment. Um, I know me and Shane both want an API that's more about building a query of the things you want to insert. So you could add join clauses if you're building a, a complex insert statement. Uh, but right now, insert uh, specifically is all about here is a literal list of rows, and I want you to insert them. Um, so it, I mean, that certainly does the job for everything we're doing in Circuit Hub, but I think there's uh, some room for improvement. Uh, likewise, update is a two, I think, essentially a two parameter function. Uh, you specify your where clause, you specify how you want to update each of your rows, um, which is basically a, a function transforming each row. Um, but again, quite sequely, and maybe there's some room for improvement there. Um, I'd probably suggest at that point, maybe popping over to Hackage and just having a look. There's an IO section in the documentation, which has the definitions of what it means to do an update, insert, and delete. Oh, thank you. Um, there may be a final question, unless mm -hmm. there's more questions. Um, is it possible to do a query where sort of the query itself depends so the shape of the query depends on the result of a of a previous query uh yeah and so definitely i think that is exactly what's uh, available to us in the in the monad instance um so if you want to run a previous query you would just bind that using normal monadic bind and then you can pass that 
selected row into any subsequent query, which is what we were doing, by the way, was uh, with songs for artists. Um, that is exactly that idea of a dependent query. Um, maybe you're talking more about kind of branching out what type of query you run. So that songs for artists query was kind of uniform in every artist that we selected. Um, you can do some more complicated things, like uh, maybe you'll select one row and then pass that row through a union. And that idea of a union would let you kind of branch out and run two very different queries, depending on what type of row you selected. Uh, and you could guard each of those uh, unions with a where clause, for example. Um, so maybe if somebody wants to see that, I'm happy to kind of demo that in the, uh, in the Relate channel on Discord as well. Um, but yeah, so th that dependency is definitely possible and exactly what's given to us by the Monad instance. OK, awesome. Um, so yeah, thank you very much um, for your talk. I really enjoyed it. Um, we're going to continue Zuri Hack after a 15-minute break, or well, at least with the, with the tracks. We have uh, two companies presenting something later. So that's Fretlink and Tweak. Um, and then this afternoon, we have the advanced track. Uh, we have a Haskell install party followed by the beginner track. Um, then we have another talk tonight, and also a GEC panel discussion with Simon Peyton Jones. Um, and then more company presentations. So there's really a lot of stuff uh, left today. Um, so I hope everyone will be able to enjoy them themselves. Um, and yeah, thank you again, Oli. Thank you. Cheers. Bye-bye.